Hello, my name is Tim Gardner. I'm a Senior Market Development Specialist at Bayer Crop Science. Today we're going to take a closer look at sclerotinia, one of the most devastating diseases in canola. We'll examine the disease itself, what it is, how it occurs, and how it spreads. We'll also look at the diagnostic tools and control measures for managing this disease. If you look at sclerotinia, it's the most serious disease that you'll find in canola. Its biggest impact that you'll find is it's going to be in yield loss. Pretty much every 1% of infection that you have, you'll lose approximately a half a percent in yield. So if you chose an example, if you had 20% infection in your field, you'd be looking at around a 10% yield loss. And yield loss is definitely going to affect your bottom line the most. So if you look at why you want to be concerned about sclerotinia as a canola grower, some of the biggest things you're looking at is decreased yield potential, death of a plant prior to seed development. And the thing that's going to result in is you're going to look at a, an uneven crop and maturation. You're also going to look at underdevelopment of the seed pods and then also reduce seed weight because of that uh, premature death of the plant. So that also can lead to seed loss during the swathing process itself. The dangerous part about this disease is the fact that once the symptoms are apparent, it's too late to treat. So you need to be more proactive with addressing this disease. So if you looked at the uh, status of sclerotinia in Western Canada right now, currently it's found in all growing regions of the prairies. It's largely driven by environmental conditions and, and moisture and, and warmer conditions generally lead towards more infection as well. But it continues to spread and in recent plant surveys across the West, we've seen anywhere from 60% up to 87% infection levels in fields. The trends are showing that it is a two-year cycle that it's, that it's operating under, but a lot of that has to do with the fact of what the weather cycles are like, and it is also in conjunction with some of our rotations that we operate now as well. Though it seems like every second year we get heavier infections, a lot of it will, will still be environmentally impacted, and it will also will depend on rotation of the crop. So the one question I'll often get is, what does sclerotinia actually look like in a canola crop? Originally it appears as a soft and watery rot on the stem or the branches of the plant, but uh, ultimately what it leads to is shredding and shattering of the stem tissue. The plants will get a really bleached uh, appearance to them, and if you're into the after-season part of it, uh, if you're looking at the stubble, you'll, uh, you'll often find the black fungal bodies within the stems of the infected plants. The pods are going to prematurely ripen, and, and the thing that can be, have a huge impact for that is that you'll have a crop that looks like it's ready to swath, but in fact you, uh, you could be dealing with a double-edged sword with that one and the fact that you'll have plants that are prematurely dead, but the balance of the crop may actually still be on the green side to swath yet, so you could lose on both fronts. So one of the questions that is out there is, how does the infection occur? Um, sclerotinia is kind of a dangerous thing in the fact that it, that it will affect the crop in a lot of ways. The main thing that you're looking at is that the fact that it does overwinter on the crop in the stubble and the residues and those residues will be often carry along for a couple of years because of uh, the zero till practices that we have. One thing that's often considered is the fact that those sclerotia bodies are, it's almost like a Tupperware system where they, they actually live and harbor themselves within the stubble itself but they'll remain dormant in the soil for a number of years. But eventually, once they do uh, progress, the apothecia or the mushroom-like structures that germinate from those bodies will end up releasing spores into the canopy and they'll infect the, the actual flower petals. And then once the petals actually drop back down, you'll see the st actual stem infections happening. Um, but the things that are also conducive for the disease are definitely warmer and more moisture conditions. Um, a heavy crop canopy creates a greenhouse-like effect for it. That canopy, those big leaves that are the solar panels for that plant, uh, are also the same thing. It will affect uh, and create that microclimate for it as well, too. So it is definitely more conducive for the disease to infect. Now, the other question that's out there is, uh, what, what is available for growers when it comes to determining what kind of risk levels you have with sclerotinia and maybe what are some of the best methods to use? Up until now, the disease risk assessment card, which was set up with the Canadian Canola Council, has been a pretty good system of at least getting a really good read on where you're at. And it takes into consideration uh, several things. One, you know, you're looking at your rotation. When was the last time you grew canola? Uh, what kind of previous infection levels have you experienced in the field? What are the current environmental conditions? Uh, weather forecasts? What's, how do things look there? and then what kind of regional risks you have as far as maybe other crops that can be infected by sclerotinia as well. 
The forecast maps that are out there, uh, both the private and the government, uh, have worked on these. And the biggest thing they take into consideration is what kind of temperatures are we experiencing and what kind of moisture levels or forecasted moisture levels that we're dealing with. Pedal testing is another method that is available out there for uh, diagnosing the disease. The challenge with it previously has been the fact that it has been a fairly time-consuming process. By the time you find out whether the disease is present or not, you might have actually missed your window to apply a, a foliar application. Now, there are lots of good signs. There's a new uh, development that's coming up in the near future where you could be looking at a much shorter turnaround from a, you're looking at a, probably a four to six hour uh, turnaround so you can address it and you can actually get into the crop and, and apply a foliar fungicide in a timely fashion. What are the best methods that you can use to mitigate the risk of sclerotinia? There really is no one silver bullet when it comes to sclerotinia management. The key to sclerotinia control is implementing an integrated approach using multiple control practices. This is going to include both cultural and agronomic controls and in conjunction with fungicide usage and genetic resistant varieties as well. What are some of the best cultural practices that we can carry out? Having a proper crop rotation is definitely beneficial. But because of the tendency of this disease to overwinter and carry on from season to season, uh, you do have a higher risk. And, and it also depends on some of your uh, other crops in, in your rotation as well, too, not just canola. But the windborne spores that result from this, they can come in from neighboring fields as well, too. So there's definitely a, a consideration there. There's no real correlation with sclerotinia incidence in the years between a susceptible crop, and this has been, been proven in the past. However, you really should try to avoid planting uh, either in fields that have had a really tight rotation with canola or, a, or a, another crop that's susceptible. And if, if at all possible, try to avoid fields that had uh, neighboring fields that had canola the year before. A couple other things to consider for cultural practices. One is seeding rates and row spacing. There's no doubt having a thicker, denser crop uh, is going to create more of a canopy in there that does make for a better uh, microclimate for the apothecia to thrive in. The thing about a thick stand as well is it also results in the potential for more lodging as well too and you can get cross infection when plants will be diseased and then lodge onto the, the neighboring plant. So you know some of the things to look at is using varieties that have stronger standability ratings so it'll help prevent lodging in that sense. Crop fertility is another one. Uh, we're targeting higher yields now, higher than ever and anything that you do to create a really good environment for a, a really good crop is also conducive for the disease to manifest itself. Another thing to consider is what role do fungicides play uh, for the management and control of sclerotinia. Now sclerotinia can be effectively be managed uh, with a single fungicide application. Typically if you can apply in that 20 to 30 percent bloom range, though you can with some products go out to the 50 percent. It is better to go early uh, as a whole because uh, a lot of times your early infections are going to be the ones that will infect the main stem and cause the entire plant to die off essentially. So that time frame, you're looking at 15 to 20 flowers that are going to be open on the main stem with very little petal drop at this point in time and uh, certainly uh, not any pod formation either. So if you want to look at fungicides that offer some of the best protection for sclerotinia or canola crop, one of the obvious choices you'll be looking at is proline. Um, the thing with it is uh, you're effectively looking at reduction levels of uh, up to 80% uh, in the crop, uh, which is definitely going to result in a, a significant yield savings in your crop. Proline's been a highly effective uh, product. It's been used for a number of years, and the active in it, prothioconazole, uh, is globally known and uh, well used for, for managing sclerotinia. And uh, the added bonus that comes with it is the fact that um, Proline is a, is a highly concentrated product, so very small volumes to actually have to handle, easy to mix, easy to apply. Even starting uh, fresh on a field that has never seen canola before, you still have to understand that there are risks with this disease. It ends up going back to the consideration of what's been growing close by. I had an experience a couple of years ago where I was on a field with canola where we'd never ever seen canola on there before, but all the surrounding fields the year before did have canola on them, and we still experienced levels up to 10% incidence, even with no past history of canola in the field. One of the challenges and decision factors that you need to consider when it comes to managing sclerotinia and canola is being very proactive with this disease. You need to make sure you're staying in front of it. If you're planning on growing a good aggressive canola crop, then you need to budget uh, for a fungicide application like a proline. 
and, and be in front of it. The one thing with this disease is that in, if you don't plan for it, often the window can close. You cannot see this disease coming at you much like you would with a serial disease. In this case, once you see the symptoms, it's already too late. And one question I often get asked is, if I'm going to be budgeting some dollars for an actual fungicide application in canola, what is the best time and when should I be applying it? And without a doubt, the best time to look at spending your fungicide dollar in a canola crop is when you're looking at spraying it in that early flowering stage, protecting against sclerotinia, because that is going to give you your best return on your dollar, and it'll also give you the most yield protection as well. For more information on sclerotinia and protecting your canola crop, please visit bearcropscience.ca or talk to your bear crop science representative or your local retailer.